Organic reaction mechanisms show how electrons move in the midst of elementary steps leading from reactants to products. But you can't just use curved arrows to depict any old movements of electrons that you'd like to in an organic reaction mechanism. What we draw has to be consistent with the experimental evidence, things like kinetic experiments, observations of reactive intermediates, and things like this. And when it comes to reactions with ionic intermediates, there are only about 10 valid electron flows that appear in organic reaction mechanisms. All the mechanisms you learn throughout organic chemistry one and two will be built from these elementary steps. And so when you're drawing mechanisms, it's very important that every step you draw needs to fit into one of these roughly 10 boxes when you're drawing mechanisms. Don't do anything that is not on this list. It's almost certainly not correct. What I want to do on this slide is just briefly mention these 10 elementary steps of polar organic reaction mechanisms and highlight the ones we'll focus on in organic chemistry one and organic chemistry 2. And there are a couple that are much less common, particularly in organic chemistry 1, than the others that I'm going to highlight as well. So the first step here, the so-called A sub N step, we'll call that this nucleophilic attack as well. This is the attack of a nucleophile at a six electron center like a carbocation or a group 13 element, something like this. Extremely common step. Departure of a nucleophuge will more commonly call loss of a leaving group. And for our purposes, a leaving group is synonymous with the term nucleophuge. This is a group that takes a pair of electrons with it when it breaks off from an organic molecule, typically forming a stable anion or neutral molecule containing a lone pair. That's what we call the leaving group. We'll also see proton transfer. In fact, we've already seen a great deal of proton transfer, and we'll continue to see proton transfer popping up over and over and over again in organic reaction mechanisms, particularly when strong acids or strong bases are used as reagents. We'll also encounter the bimolecular nucleophilic substitution, or SN2 and E2 steps. These are important steps in particular for alkyl halides, as we'll see later in the course. And then we'll see attack of an electrophile at a pi bond, particularly when we start talking about alkenes and alkynes later in the course. These are nucleophilic carbon groups containing double and triple bonds that can react with electrophiles in this A sub E step, figures prominently into those mechanisms. And then um, we will not commonly see the reverse of this, which is the departure of what we might call an electrofuge, a group that breaks off without taking a pair of electrons with it. This is not common in introductory organic chemistry. Typically when this happens, it will be via proton transfer, as we'll see later in the course. And then finally, 1-2 rearrangement is very typical of carbocations, and we'll study reactions involving carbocation intermediates a great deal in organic chemistry 1, and we'll see how these 1-2-R or 1-2 rearrangement steps figure prominently into the reactivity of quite a few carbocations. Steps 2 and 4 are more common in organic chemistry 2 courses and are extremely important for the reactivity of the carbonyl group. So you'll encounter these steps later. We won't see them hardly at all in organic chemistry 1. So the steps you see here highlighted in blue are the most important for organic chemistry 1. And although it may seem like a lot of information overwhelming right here, I like to lay all this out right now just to get you thinking and to remind you that Every elementary step you see and every elementary step you draw should fit into one of these 10 boxes. As you're looking at elementary steps, you should be thinking about what you're looking at in terms of language like nucleophilic attack or loss of a leaving group or protons getting transferred or this is a substitution process. Really, this is a relatively limited set among the myriad reactions that you'll encounter between now and the end of organic chemistry too. And thinking very carefully about this limited set will help you manage the large amount of information that you're going to encounter between now and the end of your study of organic chemistry. So I encourage you to keep these elementary steps in mind. And we're going to practice with these steps a great deal. Before we get there, I just wanted to survey the most important steps for organic chemistry one with a little more detail, showing curved arrows and an example of each elementary step that we'll actually see in a reaction mechanism later in the course or in organic chemistry too. The first step I wanted to highlight is nucleophilic attack. This involves the donation of a non-bonding lone pair in the nucleophile to often a ca carbocation or other six electron center, like a neutral group 13 element like boron or aluminum. And this is the electrophile. And this is just a single curved arrow 
starting from the lone pair and ending at the electrophilic center, and it corresponds to the formation of a new sigma bond here between oxygen and carbon. This is a typical nucleophilic attack step. Now, nucleophilic attack can also happen to groups that are involved in pi bonds, and I wanted to highlight that on this slide. Technically speaking, if we just look at what's here, this corresponds to what we'll call nucleophilic addition to a polarized pi bond. The CO double bond is polarized toward oxygen, and the cyanide anion is donating a pair of electrons to the carbon as the CO pi electrons are moving up to oxygen. But of course, thinking in resonance terms, we could have pushed the CO pi electrons up to oxygen initially, generating this structure. And if we focus on what this looks like, this actually looks like nucleophilic attack, right? Carbocation, a lone pair, a bond forming via the lone pair being donated to the carbocation. So on some level, this nucleophilic addition to a polarized pi bond is redundant with nucleophilic attack, and this is a point you'll return to in organic chemistry too. Departure of a nucleophuge, or what we'll more commonly call loss of a leaving group, corresponds to the cleavage of a bond between typically carbon and another element where the other element takes a pair of electrons with it, forming a species whose formal charge is one unit lower than what it was in the original compound. So here, for example, we see Cl- forming when the carbon-chlorine bond breaks toward chlorine. This puts a new lone pair on the chlorine and converts its formal charge from neutral to negative one. At the same time, a carbocation is left behind. And one thing to notice about this step is it's the reverse of nucleophilic attack. If you imagine Cl- as the nucleophile right here, this is the reverse of what's happening in the loss of a leaving group step. And the leaving group here is chlorine or chloride. This forms a carbocation and chloride anion. And one thing to notice about chloride anion is that it's the conjugate base of HCl, a strong acid. And this is very typical of what we'll call good leaving groups. They're very stable anions that are the conjugate bases of strong acids. Although we won't see it directly in organic chemistry one, I wanted to mention beta elimination as a kind of loss of a leaving group in which the leaving group is pushed out by an adjacent lone pair. And an example of this is shown here with this lone pair on nitrogen essentially pushing out the oxygen, breaking the CO bond towards oxygen. Now, if we think about drawing this without the pushing arrow from the nitrogen, just with cleavage of the CO bond, this actually looks like loss of a leaving group. This looks like D sub N, and the resulting structure we get is, in fact, a resonance structure of the structure up here. So on some level, loss of a leaving group and this beta elimination type electron flow are sort of redundant with each other. However, in this particular case, and this is a point we'll return to in Organic Chemistry 2 in more detail, because the leaving group is being pushed out by the nitrogen, this tends to be quite a bit faster than this bond just breaking by itself without any sort of impetus. So the adjacent lone pair is actually important to the rate of loss of the leaving group. For our purposes, though, I just wanted to highlight that loss of a leaving group can occur at these atoms linked to atoms bearing heteroatoms, and in that case, we typically call this beta elimination, a step you'll see much, much more of in organic chemistry, too. Proton transfer we're now very familiar with. A base donates a pair of electrons to an acid, taking H plus from it, and the HX bond breaks toward X, forming X minus the conjugate base of the acid. So an example of a proton transfer between ammonia and um, methane sulfonic acid is shown here, and it gives this conjugate acid and this conjugate base. One thing worth noting when drawing curved arrows for proton transfer is that resonance type electron flow can be incorporated into the proton transfer process, and it's still proton transfer, right? So here's another example of a very similar electron flow. All I did was replace the O in the original sulfonic acid with a nitrogen. And this nitrogen is picking up this proton now. And rather than just landing negative charge on the nitrogen through electron flow like this, I'm pushing it on through 
so that it lands on oxygen. And these two arrows are more or less just showing the generation of an alternative resonance form with the negative charge on oxygen rather than nitrogen. This is still proton transfer because all we're doing is pushing electrons to generate a better resonance form than we would have if we just landed on nitrogen. And the incorporation of resonance type electron flow into elementary steps doesn't really change how we label them, doesn't change how we think about them, and doesn't change their fundamental nature in the vast majority of cases. This is still just a proton transfer, even with the extra couple of curved arrow flourishes, so to speak, that are showing the generation of an alternative resonance form. We're going to study the SN2 and E2 steps in great detail later, so I'm not going to talk about them in detail here just yet. But I did want to highlight 1-2 rearrangement, as this is a relatively simple electron flow that is very common and very important for carbocation intermediates. So what's happening here is a sigma bond. Sigma electrons are migrating from a carbon adjacent to a cationic carbon to that cationic carbon. So this arrow is showing the movement of this bond toward this cationic center. And the methyl group that's connected right here just is along for the ride. So what happens here is this bond essentially migrates over with the CH3 implied right here just along for the ride as this migration occurs. It's called a 1-2 rearrangement because the bond migrates from carbon 1 to carbon 2 right next door. Notice also that this shift in the bond has left the carbon where the bond originated without an electron. It's caused the positive charge to shift from carbon 2, we might say, in the original structure, to carbon 1 in the product. And these 1-2 rearrangements are quite frequently driven by the formation of a more stable carbocation. That's happening here as we go from a secondary to a tertiary carbocation. Most reaction mechanisms in organic chemistry involve multiple elementary steps. But every polar reaction mechanism you encounter will just be a sequence of these steps. And each of those steps is going to have one of those 10 labels that we looked at at the start of this video. An example of a multi-step mechanism with these labels is shown here. The first step is a proton transfer. HBr, an acid, is transferring a proton to this oxygen, a base. Then we have loss of a leaving group. The CO bond breaks toward oxygen and water is lost as a leaving group. And it's actually quite common for the H2O to be completely left out because it's sort of inorganic in a sense. Um, or to be drawn like this, minus H2O, indicating that we're going to not draw the H2O. We're going to remember it's there, but it's gone off and it's not going to participate in the mechanism to any more uh, degree. And then next we have a carbocation rearrangement with this bond migrating over. This puts positive charge here. And then finally we have nucleophilic attack. So notice way back in this first step we generated Br- via this electron flow. That Br- comes back into the mechanism at this point and attacks the carbocation to form a new bromine carbon bond. So we can describe this mechanism as a four-step process, proton transfer, loss of a leaving group, carbocation rearrangement, and nucleophilic attack. And the second point is important to keep in mind that flexibility with the labeling system and how we think about describing elementary steps is key. Particularly resonance can cause a lot of confusion. Curved arrows that just show the generation of a particular resonance form aren't really essential to what's going on with electron flow. So don't get too bogged down in the details, particularly when alternative resonance forms are involved. You'll want to think flexibly and try to see in particular one strategy that can help here is where are the sigma bonds made and broken. Focusing on where sigma bonds or single bonds are made and broken will often lead you to the right elementary step label. For example, noticing here I'm breaking an HBr sigma bond. There's a good sign. That's a good sign that this is a proton transfer elementary step. 